Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm your host, PJ Weary, and I'm here today with Dr. James Markham. Uh, Dr. Markham earned doctorates in philosophy from Boston College and in physiology from the University of Cincinnati Medical College. He also earned a Master's of Arts in Theological Studies from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a faculty member at Harvard Medical School for almost two decades before arriving at Baylor University. He has received grants from several funding agencies, including the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the American Heart Association. He delivers invited lectures frequently at both national and international conferences, and his current research interests include the philosophy and history of science and medicine. Dr. Markham, so glad to have you today. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, and today, what we were talking about is uh, you've done a good amount of work on what is person-centered healthcare, and I'm really excited about this one because uh, I think it allows us to get more into depths of what may be the problems with healthcare in the United States without uh, getting too much into the weeds of uh, political rhetoric, uh, and maybe offer some uh, just really vital solutions that we need. Uh, but before we get into all that. Uh, talk to me, uh, Dr. Markham, how did you get interested in philosophy of science and philosophy of medicine? Well, um, when I was a postdoc at um, MIT and, and, and Harvard, um, I took a course from a f- philosopher of science by the name of Thomas Kuhn. Mm. Wrote a book called The Structures of Scientific Revolution. You've heard of the term paradigm shift. Mm-hmm. He's the originator of that term. I really enjoyed his class. And so I started to take more philosophy courses. I'd never had a philosophy course before. When I was an undergraduate, I signed up for a philosophy course, went to the first lecture. And this person launches off into some proof of the existence of God. I mean, it was so far over my head. I got <laughs> up out of the class, walked down to the registrar and said, look, I want to drop this course and take another science course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so philosophy was my, really my thing. But I, as, as I sort of matured as, as, as a thinker, hmm. um, it became apparent that there were important issues, particularly conceptual issues that I think oftentimes we uh, we sort of ignore. And Kuhn sort of helped me with that. And I, I sort of got to know him uh, rather well. And he was said, if you really want to do this and be serious about it, you have to go get another doctor. And I thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. But eventually that's that's the way it turned out. Which to me is a real testament to your perseverance. I, <laughs> that That's really, really amazing. Uh, how did you get interested? And I forgot to mention this. You asked me how I became interested in this topic. Uh, I also did um, phil- uh, most of my philosophical work with Gadamer, and he has the enigma okay. of health. Uh, so mm-hmm. the person-centered healthcare definitely resonated with me from a philosophical standpoint as well, uh, as well as personal. And of course, uh, you know, from political standpoint, uh, it's a, a big issue right now. Um, I think just a national no, especially issue. with COVID. Right. <laughs> going on. I mean, it's just COVID has just completely yes. changed the landscape. Yes. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how things settle. Um, but how did you get interested in person-centered healthcare? Well, when I came, um, to Baylor, it was, you know, a, a philosophy job in, in the philosophy department. And uh, they had a course here uh, that was philosophy of medicine. And mm. they had just started up a medical humanities program. And so uh, no one in the philosophy department really wanted to, to teach that course. So <laughs> along with <laughs> philosophy of science, I was invited to, to teach that course. And I found I just I just really enjoyed that course. Mm. I enjoyed the pre-med students who were really interested in more than just sort of the technical or the scientific dimension mm. of medicine, but also the humanistic side. So I taught that course, and I still teach that that course today, and I became director of the medical humanities program for about a dozen years. And so that led me into writing one of my first texts on philosophy and medicine, which was an introductory text, which I called subtitled uh, Humanizing. Mm. 
hmm. medicine, there was a big push, and there still is a big push, to sort of uh, sort of emphasize or to reintroduce that that dimension, that that humanistic dimension. And do you want? I, I can sort of go into the a little of the history, sure, of of why this is the case. Uh, basically, it stems from a. Have you heard of the Flexner Report? Uh, no, sir. 1910. No. Uh, this was Abraham Flexner, um, who basically took a look at medical education, medical schools, both in Canada and the United States, and it was around 150 schools that he looked at. Wow. And the the school, it, it was just. There were proprietary schools so that, you know, anyone could open a medical school. You and I could open a medical school if we just had paying students. <laughs> I mean, that's that's all you really needed. Seems problematic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you had, you know, there 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 was really no standardization of of uh, of medical education mm. uh, and therefore practice. So you had allopathy, homeopathy, hydropath, a, a whole different approaches. So in 19, the, the late 1900s, uh, ni 1908 or so, uh, the Carnegie Foundation wanted to take a look at medical education. And so um, Abraham Flexner was invited to, um, to do that, that study. Mm. And interestingly, his brother was Simon Flexer, um, who was director of the Rockefeller Institute. And his brother, Simon, was actually a graduate of uh, Johns Hopkins. Okay. So the model that was used to evaluate all these schools was, was Johns Hopkins, which actually had the audacity to require a couple years of college education before you could go to medical school. I mean, there are some places you didn't even have to have a high school education. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, you know, how... The, the sort of lack of rigor yes, uh, yeah. that existed there. So what um, Flexner did is that he took a look at all these schools and he, he he sort of said, you know, this is this is you know what these schools sort of need to live up to. Hmm. And he came up with what was called the two plus two, and that is there would be two years of uh, lectures in, in in terms of the basic science and clinical science, and then two years of rotation. And the AMA jumped on board with this, and this pretty much shoved medicine towards the sciences. Mm. So at one point, medicine was even thought to be the youngest science. Uh, Thompson wrote a book uh, entitled that. And what's interesting is you went from around 150 uh, medical schools, and you had a closure of almost 90 schools. So you had about 65 schools left over. Most of them were associated with uh, universities mm. or with hospitals that could actually, or, or medical schools could actually do research. And that was this big push, was research was going to sort of solve the problems uh, for medicine. And there was a big backlash mm. uh, to that, especially by the older clinicians, because they felt that their experience of dealing with the patient, like Osler, uh, William Osler, a, well, a well-known clinician, um, that science was necessary, but it was just one part of the equation for, for being a good clinician. Hmm. And so the science is pretty much to take over um, yeah. in, in terms of medicine. So we're reduced down to, you know, these diagnostic tests, and from these diagnostic tests, um, you know, therapies are sort of uh, then enlisted. So that's that's been the problem. It's and that was the problem up to about 1990, when the NIH uh, all of a sudden wasn't funding as much basic medical research or mm. clinical medical research that it had done in the past. Mm -hmm. And so now it was up to um, clinicians and biomedical scientists to come up with their own funding. And a lot of that has come through, you know, developing diagnostic tests and, and therapies. 
And, and so there's this conflict of interest that obviously uh, emerges if, if you're having the people who have to fund their research in order to come up with effective therapy. You, you have to be somewhat careful that, you know, they're not biasing their, their results. Not doing it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's because they're, they're in charge of the criteria for evaluating it. Correct. Am I, am I following you? Well, I mean, it, uh, eventually you have to have uh, uh, FDA uh, approval, but as we've seen with the CDC and the FDA, there's, there's plenty of documentaries out there, uh, you know, on Netflix and the like, which, which raise some disconcerting uh, thoughts about, about regulation. Yeah. But for the most part, it, it, it sort of functions, but it opens up that avenue. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, you, know, you mentioned something about how it almost seems like they were treating patients as the object of their study. Does that treating the patient as an object, um, if I'm overstepping uh, with the question, feel free to correct the question itself, but treating a patient as an object, did they feel the need to relieve the patient of responsibility? Um, yes. In, Would you like an in example? In some sense. Example? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, well, you want to provide an example? Well, I, I didn't know if the question was clear, so I can provide an example if or if you have something. Go ahead. Well, yes, I mean, patients have been objectified for for the most part. They've they've just sort of become uh, a physical body made up of physical components. Mm -hmm. And the one of the earlier commentators on the Flexman report was a Harvard physician. Uh, by the name of Francis Peabody. Mm. And he wrote a, a paper called The Care of the Patient. Mm. And in that paper, he talks about Mrs. Brown, who comes in with some just gastric distress. And at the time, all the attending physicians run all these diagnostic tests and find nothing absolutely wrong with her. And just simply say, Mrs. Brown, we've done the diagnostic tests. There's nothing really organic wrong with you. Uh, we'll give you a tonic and you can go home. Mm. And Flexner, I mean, uh, um, Peabody says, look, you know, really what they've done here is they've objectified this patient and not, you know, empowered this patient uh, to really be part of the, of the diagnostic process. And, so he says, you know, what a clinician really needs to do is to continue to ask questions because mm. really the scientific method is about asking questions, pursuing until you get the, uh, the, the solution to the problem. <clears throat> and so he said what was problematic here is that they only got basically a, a snapshot mm. of the patient rather than getting an expressionistic painting. Hmm. Which he says, you take the patient and you embed the patient within that person's life. Hmm. And from that, then you can make a diagnosis. Hmm. And an excellent example of that is by Richard Weinberg, who wrote a paper called Communion. And in there, he has, he has a mid-20-year-old woman come in who has gastric distress. And she's been to every GI specialist in the town. And so she comes to Weinberg. And basically what he finds by engaging her and the connection between them is that she worked in a bakery. The family had a bakery and he liked Napoleons. <laughs> so he asked her about Napoleons in, in the city. And, and she's, you know, she said, these, these are the good places, but that made a connection right on the first uh, consultation. Mm. And, he could not find anything the matter with her organically and said, you know, come back in a month. Well, she was back the next week because mm. he had made a connection. And in that next consultation, instead of talking about her problem, they just talked about baking. And so he said, well, I'll see you in another month. She was back the next week. 
And interesting, this time he noticed on this third consultation, dark rings under her eyes. Now, he hadn't noticed that before. Yeah. He's a GI specialist. Yeah. He's not trained to see dark rings under the eyes. And he says, have you not been sleeping? And she says, no, I've been having nightmares. And the nightmares were a result of her being sexually accosted mm. when she was a teenager. Uh. And so she could not tell this to her family. She she came from an Italian family. Mm. Uh, and that would have just been too much for that for that family. And so by by just engaging with her as a person mm. at a personal level, he was able <laughs> yeah. to really she she was healed. Yeah. I mean that that is an incredibly good example of getting what PBD would have called that impressionistic painting uh, of, of the patient. And I think for the most part, healthcare workers would like to do that. Mm. Um, but pretty much healthcare has become economized. Yeah. 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 And so not only was the scientification of, of medicine, but, you know, within the last couple of decades, um, it's it's been the economization, and so now you have companies that that are interested in in making money. Nothing wrong with making money, but it, it, you have to fulfill your purpose too. Yeah, it it can become problematic. Uh, would another word for economized be uh, they start to focus? Maybe another way of saying that they start to focus on efficiency. Yes. Yes. And number of patients in. Yes. How much time you have. Yes, uh, uh, I've I've known healthcare workers who have quit their job uh, simply because you know they're expected to see you know dozens of patients mm. within a day, and that that's I just can't see that benefiting anyone. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I I think this is coming from my own work in Gautamer, but just uh, observing real like observing life that if you focus too much on efficiency, then uh, and you put that on human beings human beings are not efficient you know what like he actually um yeah, i believe it's peabody who, who was it no it was richard weinberg dr weinberg yeah uh weinberg. i mean that's not efficient like right. i mean like the, a lot of healthcare would be really frustrated that she kept coming back but that's how he and solved the problem which actually saves he, he, money in the long term but sorry yes, go ahead. yes i mean he he did this you know generally on his own time yeah and on his own dime, yeah. For for the most part, mm. and you know, un, unless we can have a and what what, what was very interesting uh, about that situation between Weinberg and and his patient was that at first he realized that he was a GI specialist and not uh, a psychiatrist, and so he tried to say to the patient, "Look, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not really trained in this, yeah, uh, but I, I'm happy to refer you." And she said, no. Hmm. She said, I trust you. Yeah. 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 Which is. And so I think oftentimes what we have to realize in healthcare that the patient really does have a lot of empowerment, not just of themselves, but of the other person, the healthcare uh, professional. Yeah. And I think I, I really appreciate your answer because I think it ended up answering my question when I asked about responsibility. What I was referring to is that concept of empowerment, right? That idea that uh, patients have to take control of their own uh, their own bodies. Uh, the example I was going to give, um, they just recently changed the high blood pressure mark for uh, blood pressure medicine. And so my mom had been on the boundary for years. And she went to the doctor and they tried to give her blood pressure medicine. And she was like, I'm, she was like over by like five points or something. And she's like, I'm not, I, I know I've needed to exercise more and diet for like a decade. Like, I'm just going to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of dealing with all the side effects, paying for it, all those things. And it's one of those things where they were frustrated. And, um, if, the, if that makes sense, you know, they, they looked at her and like, no, no, you need to take this medicine. And she's like, but if I do this, it'll solve it. But they didn't want yeah. to leave it up to her, right? Because they've seen too many people who don't take responsibility. Well, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the pharmaceutical industry send reps in mm. who are pushing a particular drug. And for a lot of physicians, they sort of get a kickback. Yeah. And 
Uh, I mean, I that's that is at best problematic. <laughs> at best, yeah. No, it's uh, yes. There are a lot of other words that could fit there. No, exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, but I also think, do you, uh, and I don't fully understand the industry, but is there also a problem with um? legal ramifications if you let someone walk out of the office and you just say exercise more and they don't uh, i think there was a recent case where someone got uh doctor got sued when he just said you need to diet more and they just wanted the pill huh yeah that's that's an interesting case i i i'd have to take a look at at that case cuz the industry standard hmm. is pretty much a pill for every ill. Yes. Yes. And so, yes, you could, there are probably lawyers who would be more than happy to take on yeah. a, a case like that. The issue is that what's the evidence right. to support either therapy? I mean, if, if the evidence recommends that by dieting, that that is just equally effective as, as taking the pill, then you know the the standard sort of has to be reinvestigated mm. in a way but our our medical standards are pretty much set up that we're reactionary yes yeah once we have the problem then we sort of react and generally it is since it's allopathy it's usually through some pharmaceutical mm. uh that that's going to be recommended in order to to treat that disease and of course Pharmace, pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical in, industry has a really big interest in in terms of promoting that, and certainly pills can be rather, or pharmaceutical drugs can be rather effective. Mm. But again, lifestyle can also be very effective. Um, I mean, I I personally can modulate my um, heart and and heart rate. I I I do a lot of uh, exercising mm. simply because at one point they wanted to put a pacemaker in because I was having some problems, but and that's been almost thirty years ago. Wow! Uh, and and so by exercising and and diet, I've I've been able to, you know, to stay pretty healthy at least live another thirty years. Yeah. So I I, I think there are a lot of issues mm. in our healthcare system. Uh, that that really need to be addressed all the way from uh, nutrition to sleeping to uh, to just general stress sort of yeah stress and living yes yeah uh, and I think that leads us uh, really well into kind of that main question what is person centered healthcare I think the person centered healthcare sort of comes out of um, there there was a a shift towards patient-centered care. Mm. Now, um, almost fifty years ago, mm. and certainly that was an important shift. But I think it left the healthcare providers uh, sort of in in an awkward position, mm. and a lot of that came from the autonomy of the patient. Um, and so one had to respect that autonomy uh, and, and sort of empower the patient. And part of the problem there is that sometimes patients, <laughs> you know, they they really don't know enough. Yeah. Uh, in order to make a, a really well-informed uh, decision. So what, what happened is that um, in order to humanize, medicine it had to really focus upon the human person hmm. and both the person as the patient as well as the healthcare professional and so there it's just not so much the autonomy of the person as it is the dignity of the person and hmm. that's both of the patient as well as the healthcare professional so what you want is a healthcare system that really respects, sure, autonomy is important, uh, beneficence is important, but 
the integrity, what that person is worth, is is really at at its ground. What what makes us who we are hmm. uh, as persons. It's it's who we are. That that dignity defines us. Um, does that sort of help? Yeah, oh, I love that dignity defines us is uh, an incredible line. Yes. Um, thank you. The uh, and I, so and I think this is kind of attached to it. I, I've looked at some of your interviews um, that you've talked about the virtuous physician. <laughs> um, is that connected? And how is that connected if it is? Yes. Um, virtue ethics, you know, has its roots with within the Greek, ancient Greek philosophy, uh, of course, with the uh, with the four virtues and the like. So I think what's important about virtues mm. is that they really help us to implement our values. Mm. And so when I teach uh, medical ethics, I actually begin with what's the, the term is axiology which is a study of, of, of values. And what I try to help the students is for them to connect with what values do you have? And it's from what you value then, you'll equip yourself with the virtues that will allow you to realize those values or to use those values mm. uh, in, in terms of your own behavior. Um, now, Unfortunately, a, a major value in our society is, you know, <laughs> obviously money mm. and um, power, prestige. All of these are, and in some sense, they're they're important. But if they're the only values that really drive, or if they're overemphasized, um, it can result in harm. Yeah. Uh, to to others. So how do you help someone develop their values, uh, assess and develop their values? Well, that's that's the whole course is we sort of go over what our core values, who has written. There, there are a lot of people out there who have, 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 have written on this. So there are a lot of little diagnostic tests that, that I had them take to help mm. them uh, identify their values. And all these things are available online. I mean, you can go on and and get them in. So, uh, do you mind naming a few? Um, I know I put you on the spot. No, there. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I don't have any right off the top of my. Okay, no, no worries, no worries. Yeah, <laughs> but I've, I mean, everyone has access to Google. If you're listening yeah. to this, then you obviously have access to Google. So, yeah, right. So, is yeah, I think what what you have to do is oftentimes you have to sort of find that diagnostic test which you think is is best for you mm. that that you sort of track with yeah um and so i i have a number of them out there that i have for the students to uh to engage to determine their values uh and then from that we launch into the to the various virtues mm. and so i go over the four uh cardinal virtues themselves and then the three theological virtues mm. as well and so I use those as as seven categories in which to take a look at, you know, dozens and dozens of virtues. And I just have them reflect on, you know, how these virtues can operate within their own personal life or, or in daily life, as well as within the uh, clinical uh, situation. Yeah. So, and, and we, we do take a look then at, I mean, the advertisements from hospitals is just very interesting because they tell you what you value. You just go on, mm. uh, you know, you want to Google something, just go on to some of these uh, clinics and they'll tell you what they value. You know, they value you, health, uh, wholeness, things, things of this sort. So it's it's what what I try to have the students do is I sort of promote this idea of a moral compass mm. and that. By using these values and and the virtues, they can align that moral compass, which will help them in terms of negotiating. And so, you know, we we take a look at a lot of um, 
sort of issues that are going on from food ethics to eugenics. And, you know, I show these documentaries like What the Health. Um, and at the end, I, I really try to get them to use that compass uh, in order to take a look at a clinical ethical case case study. Um, absolutely fantastic. Um, and you mentioned something there that's really interesting to me. I noticed you got your uh, master's in theological studies from Gordon Conwell, right? Yes. What? Are you familiar with it? Yes, yes, I am. Um, it's a Presbyterian so oh. sort of. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, kind yeah, of. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of Presbyterians taught there. Yeah. Uh, I actually went to Trinity in Chicago, but I looked at Gordon oh, Conwell. Okay. So that's that's my background. Um, yeah, so David familiar. Wells used to teach there Okay. So at, at Trinity before he came to Gordon Conwell. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, what role does spirituality and or life purpose uh, play into person-centered health care? So you talked a little bit about in terms of physicians, right? You use the three cardinal ver or three theological virtues, excuse me. Um, is there any uh, value that you see in regards to patients? Oh, sure. I mean, <laughs> you know, spirituality is, is a major factor mm. uh, surrounding death and illness. I mean, the movement in terms of Western uh, healthcare was from the shaman or the or the the priest, then to the uh, philosopher mm. with uh, with Hippocrates, mm -hmm. uh, and then to the scientist um, within the 18th and 19th century. So medicine has its roots with within the temple, within the spiritual, and of course, you know, you you take Jesus, who was very active in 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 terms of of uh healing miracles. Yeah. Um so yes, um I think spirituality is a a major element mm. of of who we are um as as people because as persons we're relational. What really defines the who of us are the relations the relationships that we have. Uh and that is that is governed by our our sort of moral nature um you know where we've often been compared to a rational animal well yeah okay um i'm not going to deny that and you know um also a social being mm. but what makes all that really possible is the fact that we're at root a moral being mm. we are conscious of the morality of our behavior. Um, and it's in that sense that we're made in the image of God, mm. that we are, are conscious of one another and can place ourselves um, compassionately, hopefully, as, yeah, as healthcare yeah. providers in the, uh, in the patient's um, vulnerability and, and then benefit that patient uh, rather than than harming that patient. And that at root, medicine at root is sure science is important, hmm. technology is important, but the morality of that situation hmm. is absolutely, absolutely critical. So you go back to the Weinberg. Yeah. He did not abandon her. Yes. He actually exhibited, I mean, of all the virtues, he was incredibly courageous. Yeah. I mean, to step outside, you're, professional training yeah and listen to this person just talk yeah um and and to realize that that provided the access for this patient basically to heal yeah and she was healed at the end of this whole whole process and that by his taking on that that patient with with such courage i mean he exhibited a a moral nature that you know, it just just has to be respected, and I think immolated in 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 the healthcare system itself. Well, in our society at large, regardless yeah. of, of of the profession, I think we are just moral creatures. Mm. 
Yes. And I think what you've talked about there is that whole connection between the virtuous physician, person-centered, person-centered healthcare. And even as you uh, started uh, that train of thought, I knew you were going to go back, uh, or if you weren't, I was going to bring it up uh, to Richard <laughs> Weinberg, because that, it's that connection, right? That we are right. these moral beings in community. And that's, that's why we have to be virtuous. That's why uh, we have to be person-centered. Um, what uh, skill set would a person-centered physician need? I think there are there are two major uh, categories there. Okay. Uh, number one is care. And that goes back to Peabody's work that in order to care for the patient, you have to care about the patient. Mm. That's his famous quote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Two ideas of care there. One, you're motivated. He says you've got to love humanity. Mm. You really have to be energized by engaging the patient. You've got to care about that patient before you can actually take care of that patient in terms of the technical. Mm. And the second, I think, is the competence. And again, the competence (laughs) is going to be. Yeah, that yeah, would be important. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, you, you laugh about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. You'd be surprised. Yeah. That competent, not only in terms of the mm. technical procedures, yeah. uh, but also ethically. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you've, you've really have to have both type of competence mm. in order to provide uh, the quality health care that, that the patient is going to need. Now, those are just two broad categories yeah. uh, that I think then each uh, healthcare professional has to find what skill set they need in order to implement both care and competence so that they can provide that quality of care. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as we were talking uh, uh, before the, the episode, um, one of the things that uh, you mentioned is that attitudes have changed quite a bit uh, over uh, in our culture about medicine. Uh, what are some of the major themes that you have seen? What are the major things that you have seen change over the last uh, the, over the course of your study? Yeah, it's become a business. Mm. Um, I mean, for for the most part, you use used to have uh, and hospitals run by religious organizations where they would just, you know, they would provide care for almost anyone. Mm. Uh, and now those nonprofit, I, I don't think there are any nonprofit really hospitals. I, 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 I could be wrong about that, but the, the push has been towards, um, you know, profit. Mm. And of course, once you begin that, there's the problem then of maximizing profit for, um, the stakeholders, mm. and that's that's the kind of language that you know you hear when when you read about healthcare policy um, and its implementation in the United States. Um, so, I think if if I've seen any major change, it's been um, that drive towards um, uh, the business model. The other is that we've over medicalized. Mm. Uh, there's been a, a lot of medicalization of, you know, there's the shaking leg syndrome. Um, I don't know. I, I shake my leg quite a bit, mm. but there's a, I think there's a pill now uh, for the shaking leg syndrome. You know, I, I really don't need a pill for my shaking leg syndrome. And I kind of, <laughs> it doesn't really, although it did bother one time a student that was sitting in front of me during an exam. He said, could you stop shaking your leg? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I, I don't have, uh, I don't have a syndrome, but uh, I was definitely, I was an antsy kid. So I, I definitely got some looks during tests where I was thinking about something and I was bouncing the whole row of table, you know, the whole, <laughs> <laughs> I, like, people just like turned and like looked at me and I'm like, it Oh, just, sorry. <laughs> you're in the zone. Yeah. You know? yeah. You're in the zone. It's... <laughs> oh, that's like my apologies. No. Oh, um, but so it's not, I, I... does it need a pill? Right. Right. Yeah. It's just, let's just let it go. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's quite all right. Um, and you know, that, that is being, 
sure, there's no perfect person when it, when it comes to health. But, I mean, at, at what point do you intervene in, in terms of medical procedures and pharmacological drugs? I mean, can you just live with it? Yeah. Um, rather, rather than trying to intervene in order to, you know, reach some what you consider to be uh, perfect health. Yeah. Yeah. So I, what, what others. I, do you, oh, sorry. It's an interesting question. What, what do you see as, I mean, what, what have you seen change? I, I, uh, to be quite blunt, I'm 33 and I was blessed with pretty good health. <laughs> I mean, the biggest thing that I think I've seen has been more from the diet side of things. We talked about that beforehand, how I, um, you know, I, you, we were just taught that it was, you know, there was a pill for that. And, but I was also aware, and I think, uh, I thank my mother for this, that there, every time you take a pill, there, there are generally side effects, not always, right. but you, there's always that risk. And so I was always wary of just jumping right to that. Um, also having experiences with, uh, Different people who were close to me who took pills. They felt better. Uh, for me, it was I was struggling with depression. Um, and then after six months, they had to change uh, their medicine because it wasn't working anymore. And they were constantly in the cycle of trying different medicines. And there are always side effects. And I didn't want that if I could avoid it. And then to mm. discover that most of what I was suffering from was uh, diet. Um, really like, I mean, that blew my mind because that wasn't the way I was taught about medicine in, I mean, I don't have any kind of medical background other than, you know, just culturally. Right. And, right. uh, the little that we're taught, uh, in high school. So, um, but I'm 33, so I, I haven't, I don't have a, a breadth of experience. I don't have a background in it. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's about all I have. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so it's, I th I think we're on a path where mm. um it's it's medicine is is especially in terms of precision medicine um right it's, it's going to be targeting what it considers to be either the genes or whatever proteins that 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 might be responsible so that you can sort of fix fix the problem mm. whether or not that's that's going to happen is is really unclear. Yeah. Simply because it's it's not known. You know, there seems to be this gap between the genotype and phenotype, mm. and um, how we sort of fill that gap in, especially for patients. It's just not clear. We don't know enough uh, at this. So that's where medicine is is sort of pushing, and that's the very technical uh, end of medicine. So that at some point. You know, it, it may be that you really don't even interact at all with another person. It mm. might just be a machine, mm. uh, especially with advances uh, in deep learning and AI. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, where, where medicine is headed, I think, is more in that direction. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of that? I think the advantages... Uh, if it can happen, mm. and this is a much larger question, because if you know that you're going to have um, a certain disease, if you continue down a particular lifestyle, mm. and if you don't have the resources, say, for changing your lifestyle, then then what? Mm. I mean, it's that's that's kind of depressing, knowing that you don't have the the resources uh, in order to change your lifestyle. Say, it's a dietary. Where you know instead of eating the uh, the dollar meal, yeah, maybe you actually have to eat the salad, yeah, uh, and you can't afford the salad, yeah. Um, so I think that the advantage is that we can pinpoint what might become problematic, predict it, and thereby prevent it. Hmm. But are the resources going to be available to everyone? I mean, COVID has shown this that there that the resources available to people, not only here, but globally are not the same. Right. Um, I mean, there's, there's 
just a, an unfairness to way uh, resources are distributed. So that's a major concern that I have is just the price of all this technology. Mm. Can 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 people really afford it? Um, or so are we going to have just not the very rich who can have all the benefits of this precision medicine, but the poor <laughs> too bad. Yeah. Um, you know, good luck with your dollar meal. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny that you brought that up. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to go here, but, uh, I have discovered that eating better often is more expensive Yes, because it's actually subsidized for the, like, um, when you look at, uh, beef is subsidized, like the, we pay through taxes Big time. and, right. uh, Big time. but it, it's, it's subsidized in, in ways that are unhealthy, right? Like there is yeah. healthy beef, but it's actually not very economical. Right. Um, well, yeah. All, all you have to do, have, have you seen earthlings? No the documentary. No. Yeah. It, it talks about the, uh, how we sort of abuse animals. Mm. Uh, and there's, uh, there's also other documentaries out there that that will that will show you just the horrendous mm. conditions that animal exist uh, in terms of factory farms. In fact, one of the big fears is that you know one of the antibiotic resistant bugs, yeah. bacteria, is going to come out of you know the pig farms in in the Carolinas. Yeah. So uh, it, you know that. That raises a whole nother issue in terms of our our healthcare system itself. Yes, and I've I've actually just um, uh, for me I did watch Food Inc. And so okay. yeah, like very so everything you're saying is very familiar. I haven't watched Earthlings, but uh, when you talk about like just seeing um, cows like up to their knees in their own manure, and right. it it's. There's no way that that can be good for for the cow or for us, right? And right. anyway, yeah, cook your meat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, and, and we're we're taught like if it's a factory that it, it's better than like a farm, for instance. And then when they do actual tests on the amount of like uh, they were killing chickens in the open air and in a tent uh, at a farm, and they did tests on that versus chickens in a in a factory, right. and the factory is way worse. For yeah, bacteria, they were going after him in the tent. Right, right. <laughs> they were trying and, to prevent him from. <laughs> yes, and that was the crazy thing, and that and that was after they wash it with like bleach, which is right. uh, you know, uh, that's anyways. The, yes, yeah, so like all of this. I mean, this is part of uh, yeah. why I wanted to have it's, you on. But yeah, the 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 whole thing. I mean, with with the chickens, they they have the fecal soup. Uh, they they didn't mention that in Food Inc., but when these chickens are washed, well, you know their feces are all over the place, yeah. so they go through this water. It's just called the fecal soup, and that's washing them. Oh, <laughs> it's yeah, it, yeah, definitely don't watch it. Uh, you know, <laughs> I have had friends who like I watched it, and then I didn't care. I went and ate burgers anyways, and I was like, like, <laughs> like immediately after, I was like, I. You know, props to your bravery. That's yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and it, you know, it, it raises a much larger issue yeah. of how sustainable this is on right. a global scale. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're burning we're burning down the rainforest at an incredible rate. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, at at what point is this not going to be sustainable? Uh, that that could really be problematic to global health. Yes, uh, just you know never mind our personal health but, yeah but what about um the earth itself you know, getting into this whole gia hypothesis and yeah you know, yeah yeah the uh you i mean uh like the heat bubble that uh sat uh was it over the northwest united states which what like yeah. um i think it was uh alaska in the last couple months just had uh it's a record high for winter it was 20 degrees warmer then the previous record, not the average, wow. the previous record. And I was like, okay, I understand, like, you know, I'm in central Florida, so I meet people who are, <laughs> are skeptical about climate change. And I'm like, something's happening, <laughs> something. <laughs> but, um, but again, you know, we talk about the stress side of it. It's not fair um, 
to require people to learn so much about this so quickly, and especially when there's so much misinformation. I, I think there's a there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of uh, how we handle uh, the way information is spread. <laughs> uh right. I mean, how that's regulated yeah and I, it's not even for me I, that's part of the reason why i wanted to do this podcast was so i could have people on and whether they agree or disagree with you at least they get to listen to you in more than a 30 second sound bite because i think that a lot of the problems are way more complex than can be represented in five minutes uh, oh yes honestly like way way more than an hour right <laughs> but at least like an hour has got to be better than five minutes um <laughs> I, I, I digress. But the um, there was uh, one question I really um, kind of wanted to, uh, as it was start to wrap up here, um, end with. And that was for you. And I think some of this is, you know, in your interview talked about Thomas Kuhn. Um, and uh, you talked about the exemplar and the disciplinary matrix uh, you know, that's part of where I got the idea for the skill set question. What does an ideal physician look like? Caring and competent. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, I mean, genuinely cares. Mm. Just not about the patient, but also about himself or herself. Mm. I think we are taught in this society, we are sort of driven by this society. Um, have you ever read the book Magic Mountain? Uh, uh, no, it's Mountain? on my shelf. I should. I know it's supposed to be really good. It's it's an investment, but it's we we have to be careful not to play games, mm. to really live authentic lives, not to sort of live the banal mm. life, but to live a life that's that's genuinely caring, just not about others, but you know, really about ourselves. We have to have that genuine self-love because if we don't have that, then mm. it's going to be pretty hard to love someone else if we really can't sort of care for ourselves. And the healthcare system, I mean, there's a thing called the hidden curriculum where generally um, after you've graduated from med school, you, you sort of are in the um, uh, rotations and you are just grilled. Uh, and if you want to see an example of that, uh, there's a movie called, um, um, what is wit hmm. by, uh, um, Margaret Etz Etzen. And in there, there's an example of that, that grilling that goes on, uh, at, at the bedside when, when, um, interns are being, being taught. And, when I was at at Boston, it was often it it was often when when you're sort of in a room and you're 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 having a meeting, it's often considered the smartest person in the room. You you want to be the smart. That's what you're pushed to be. Mm. You are to perform as the smartest person uh, in that room, and I, you know, I, it's it's incredibly stressful uh, that sort of the way our education system is set up that we that we want the best and brightest rather than having an education system that produces the best and brightest that everyone can be uh so we have this uh sort of competitive system that eliminates people rather than uh empowering and incorporating them uh, i mean we we have a lot of we we need to do a lot in terms of our educational system in order to really equip people mm. to uh, to make this a better world uh, for ourselves, rather than you know not not equipping them so that they have to you know engage in activities that that really harm others mm. um, in in one way or another. So yeah. That focus, that go, yeah, no, that's 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 great. Uh, and that that focus on being the best and brightest instead of being the best that you can be stops you from engaging with others, right? Like yes. uh, when you talk about well, it becomes a competition, right? And it's even with the patient, right? Like yes. you're not going to take advice from a patient if it's very important that you're the smartest person in the room. 
especially when they come in something from like WebMD. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will say, I, I I get annoyed with people looking up things in WebMD, and I'm not even a doctor, so <laughs> it's like it's cancer every time. I have a headache. It's like I think it's cancer. Oh. I'm, <laughs> Uh, I, I love my wife and, and she's really good about it, <laughs> but there was one time she had, uh, she had, my, uh, a migraine and, uh, she looked it up on WebMD and I was like, don't, don't look it up on WebMD. <laughs> she was like, I was like, I, I think I might like, I might have cancer. And I'm like, why don't you just like take some Tylenol, drink some water and we'll see how long it lasts. And you know, it's gone yeah. like the next day, but I was, <laughs> yeah, it's called wait and see. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh man. Um, uh, last question for you. Do you feel that the field of medicine needs a paradigm shift in that kind of, in kind of coon sense? Or do you feel like this is something that would stick within the current paradigm when you talk about person centered healthcare? <sighs> yeah. Uh, is, is it a Coonian paradigm shift in that the, two approaches are sort of incommensurable with one another and that they really don't have anything to do with one another. I, I, I think what, what really needs to be done mm. is that we need to build on the biomedical field that we have and, and sort of move that along in terms of there's a, a movement towards systems mm. medicine as, as part of the precision medicine uh, movement. and that what we need to incorporate in that is this humanity, this this idea that we are training physicians not only to be, you know, caring, but 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 also competent in terms of uh, their their skill sets, um, mm. and so I think for for the future, I I really hope that we continue with the technological end of it, but really also making that available, not just to the rich and, mm. and, and to a few, but making that accessible uh, to pretty much everyone. But that re that's really a, a larger sociological question. And I, <laughs> I, I just don't know. I mean, you know, take, take a look at, you know, I grew up in a small Midwestern town yeah, that used to have industry there, and it is all gone. Right, I mean, it is, and you know, there's another documentary on <laughs> how this one Midwestern town, how uh, foreign investors came in and opened up a uh, um, uh, a factory, but they were paying a minimum wage, and there was no. Um, you know, no ability to unionize. Mm. And if you ever want to really understand the importance of the unions, um, uh, adversary in the house by, um, oh, what's his name? Um, Irving, Irving Stone. Um, it's, it's about Eugene Debs. Uh, one of the first ones to actually, uh, unionize the, uh, uh, the railroad workers. I mean, the conditions that these people worked under were incredible. Yeah. And I think as as a society, we've we're, we just find ourselves being polarized more and more and more. And it, it seems that mm. classism has has really become our our major ism mm. uh, at at this stage of the game. Yeah. And it 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 just it doesn't it you know it cares only about wealth. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 what it's what what it's based upon. But certainly, one of the the chief values uh, that it's that it's based upon. And so, I, it's the problem is so large, so much larger than just medicine. Mm. What would be the ideal physician to get at that? I, I think we've got to make some major changes. Yeah. Uh, in terms of our social structure itself. And that's, that's why I like your podcast and why I like <laughs> listening to it. You, you really take on um, a number of facets that sort of are important in terms of where we are today and sort of 
what we need to be thinking about mm. in order to really chart uh, a better future. Um, Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I mean, that's been my goal. So it's it's very uh, gratifying, but more important helps me make sure you know i i don't get a lot of feedback right now like i don't it's not i'm not a huge podcast by any means and so to hear that is is very gratifying thank you um forgive me for looking to the side i was listening um but i was looking up your books because you're talking about systems biology i know that's one of your books if someone wanted to learn more about this what is the best way or what book would you recommend of yours for them Um, in, in terms of, of systems biology, I just go on and Google. I mean, there are yeah. a lot of good authors, yeah. um, out there. Uh, if, and, and, and in terms of, uh, systems medicine, there's, there's an Institute of, of systems biology, Leroy Hood, uh, who was one of the, um, major people involved in the, uh, uh, human genome project. Mm. Uh, he has, a an Institute out. Uh, in Seattle, Washington, mm. and he has this whole systems uh, medicine thing. So I'd go on and Google his thing. He's got, um, um, he's he's just got a very nice website yeah. that, <laughs> that would introduce you to all this stuff. And he's got a newsletter that he can send you. I I subscribe to it. It's, it's okay. kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, we'll make sure to link to that uh, uh, in the description. Um, Dr. Markham, it's been such a pleasure having you on. Um, I just wanted well, to say thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to thank the uh, thank our listeners for joining us. Um, if you enjoyed the depth of conversation or learned something, please like, share, and subscribe so someone else can too. Uh, so someone else can hear Dr. Markham. And uh, I, I think the first important step is assessing the problem, right? And uh, I right. want to thank you for, for providing that for us today. Great. Well, it's been my pleasure. I just, this is, this is just a lot of fun. Yeah. You're really, you're really a great person to communicate with just, just to have a talk. Thank Your you. Your questions sir. were great. Appreciate that.